Hey guys, so uh, today I am joined by Ben Woods. Um, ben Woods is a, a, a friend of mine, somebody I've known for a long, long time, and somebody who um, has achieved great things. I'll be careful not to call him Woodsy through this, um, and I'll stick to Ben as much as I can, but apologies if I do. Ben, good to, good to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. I don't mind Woodsy. <laughs> you don't mind Woodsy? Fair enough. No, Let's go with Woodsy. Um, no, great to be here, mate. Great to see you. Uh, thanks obviously. thanks for joining us mate. and look, I, i'm i'm keen to get into the um get into your story and straight into it because um for those of you that haven't heard of um of woodsy let's call him Woods, woodsy for the sake of it then if he's okay with that um woodsy's achieved some some uh, some amazing thing and one in particular uh, and i'm honored to be talking to a guinness world record holder today uh ben you're a world record holder how did how did that feel um it was pretty special when it finally came through because after we finished the ride, there was a mm. lot of admin stuff to do to get it. But <laughs> um, <laughs> no, initially it wasn't something that we that we searched out for. Um, Jason mm. and I, my brother, we loved Guinness World Records growing up. Um, you know, it was it was something that we got nearly every Christmas, and was something that we bonded over. Um, mm. But initially, you know, there was other reasons for going that far on the ride. Um, to show Jason beautiful country, and, and it was a you know it was, it was a grab for the ride to to push for that promotion and to get more people behind mental health and well being and you know try and lower that suicide rate. So the Guinness World Record was a great tool in marketing for me, um, but it was it was yeah for sure it was a great achievement. And um, you know I put it down that me and Jace got that yeah you know, we got that together, so it was pretty special. Good on you, amazing. So just for our audience, um, tell us exactly what the, the the world record is that you that you hold together. Yeah, so it's um, the longest journey by bicycle in a single country. Um, so it's been heavily weighted and held by Indians before this, and I don't, I, I don't wish it upon myself to try and to try and beat it if an Indian person takes over it, uh, because you know, in their country they're, they're going up and down hills and through a lot of the traffic. Um, so you know, hats off to them. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's the record we hold, and um, like you've got a, a big, large country country that beat it so it was good amazing amazing achievement and, and how far how far was the ride remind me yeah so the actual um kilometers when we finished was just over twenty thousand. um but the guinness world record didn't um didn't let me include the mountain bike stages so that was going to the to the most northern part up to cape york there was about a thousand k's of, of unsealed roads up there um, there was a couple of hundred kilometers getting to the most western point of australia on sand dunes which was uh extremely difficult and some of those days were the hardest so it's a bit disheartening that they didn't include those but um yeah they stipulate it's got to all be on the same bike so it ended up being just under nineteen thousand kilometers uh is the record but uh yeah we did we did able to to knock down uh twenty thousand. amazing absolutely amazing and and uh, obviously this didn't happen just uh in a normal day and we're just going to go and do this this was driven by something really personal to you so i'm i'm keen to give the audience um an understanding of where this came from and you talked about your, your brother jace which is obviously where where this story comes from so so tell us what what, what happened um with jace tell us tell us about jace and his story and what led you to to, to being uh, being on this journey yeah so jace younger brother um we grew up um in sort of a country country place in um australia um coastal town but um one very community orientated um we had an amazing upbringing um we spent so many days in the front yard in the backyard um we both moved to the big smoke sydney together and became carpenters together there wasn't much time that jason and i didn't live under the same roof and, and we loved it we lived in each other's pockets and, and we were best mates um in his early 20s he he went through a time i think when he first moved to sydney um of going through and battling with his demons and, and he got through that for his sports for his activity he was he was very physical um he was like that in everything he did uh, he was a carpenter by trade he he then suffered again in, in his late 20s and it was it was about six months out from his passing that um, we picked up on it again, but I'd imagine he was suffering a lot longer before that. Um, you know, the immediate family knew, uh, but none of his friends outside of that knew of his struggles at all. He was he was a jovial guy. Uh, oh, yourself, you you know, you were mates with Jace, and I'm sure you, you wouldn't have picked up on that, that uh, he was battling all these demons inside. And, you know, he was, he was the person in the room that always made a joke. He, he was smiling and he, he always looked out for other people. Um, and you know, as much as we knew the battles he was going through and the help and support we got him along the way, um, 
it, it all became too much for him. Um, it was two months out from my wedding. Um, but Jace took his own life. Um, he was meant to be my best man. And, and yeah, for, for, for me, for my immediate family, for all Jace's friends, um, it shattered our world. Um, and the ride coming out of that was, was something that, um, you know, you, you never know when, when tragedy, when grief is going to, you know, knock on your doorstep, when you're going to lose, you know, your best mate, your soulmate in life. Um, but I told Jace that I'd never give up on him in life and, and that wasn't going to change just because he wasn't here anymore. Um, we had a dream to travel around Australia um, and I was going to fulfill that dream. And I, I decided to take Jace's ashes with me um, and travel around the country on a bicycle of all things. Um, you know, I saw his funeral that there was over 400 people there um, with so much love to give. Like they say grief is love with nowhere, nowhere to go. And I saw that at the funeral. I saw so much energy and I wanted to use this energy and harness it to, to put it to good, to put it to other people out there that are still here and help save them. Mm. Um, because I knew if, you know, doing this ride, 20,000 kilometers around Australia, um, could save just one other person, you know, that person could have been Jace. So that's, that's the main reason. And that was the motivation behind it. And, and, um, yeah, it was such a cathartic experience for me. It was, it was really good. Firstly, thank you for being, for telling your story and thank you for being so, so open about it as well. And, um, you've said something in there that really, uh, that really hits home for, for, for me and for a lot of the people I speak to, which is around the fact that you didn't know until six months before. And, and as you rightly pointed out, I knew Jace um, reasonably well, and, um, I certainly, I, I wouldn't have picked it up from his everyday demeanor. What was it at that six month mark that, that, that brought you into, to, to seeing it again and realizing that he was battling again? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you live in each other's pockets a lot. You know, you know someone pretty well. Um, and the signs and symptoms are the things that um, you can really pick up on for other people. Because w when someone's going through that themselves, you know, they can't see it themselves. Uh, you know, they can't see the light of day. And Jace couldn't see that. And there was signs and symptoms in Jace that I knew when he wasn't dealing so well. Um, for him, he went through a period of... Um, he had a really bad bulging disc in his back. So you've got that physical element. Um, as I said before, he, when he got out of it the first time, he was so physical. That's what got him through it. His sport, his surfing, his carpentry. Um, it did affect his work. So financially, he had difficulties there. And his relationship wasn't going so well when he was moving between Sydney and Canberra, um, you know, with his relationship. So those three elements of, uh, of relationship issues, financial issues, and physical issues, when all those three things come together, um, whether it be for a male or a female, it's, it's going to hit you and, and, um, you need to be kind to yourself. Um, Jace was very hard on himself and knew that the whole time he was growing up, he was very critical of himself. Uh, but yeah, I picked up in signs and symptoms of just, you know, change in the way he's you know, held himself, um, his confidence, his, his ability just to be present with you, you know, when you're talking to him, um, he was in another world, just so many things turning over in his head. So, you know, for me, um, he got to a stage where he just couldn't see the light of day and he was just really in a, in a deep, deep place. But I just felt that, you know, and that's a big thing. I was, I went around the country. So I spoke to a lot of schools. I did a lot of talks in schools. So I just felt that if, Jace had a known from a younger age um, that there shouldn't be any stigma around, that there should be no shame around going through mental health and depression, that it's, it is quite a common thing um, that he needs to be able to talk about it more. He, he struggled to talk about his own feelings that maybe he would have never gotten the place where he was. So that was a big thing for me to promote as I was going around Australia is that, is that lowering of the stigma. Um, don't be afraid to put up your hand. It's, you know, it's not weak to speak. Um, and yeah, we hope and we believe and I felt as we went around getting such good response from the kids is that we got that message out there. Mm, I, I think you certainly would have. And it's such an amazing story and, and uh, such an important message that would have landed with hundreds or thousands of people on your on your journey. Where, where do you think that stigma comes from? What do you think um, it is that, that, that gives talking about your mental health or the fact that you might be suffering from depression or anxiety or whatever it might be? What, why is there a stigma around? I don't know. Some, sometimes um, 
to we wake up so much and we put on an armor you know we we go out and it's like we're going into battle just going out there in the day and you know there's the social stigmas there's there's the parent stigmas there's there's the ability to to achieve and you know um always look for the the extraordinary in life where i think um and i, I found when i when i went around australia and i was very vulnerable in being able to talk about Chase, uh, talk about the story and reveal my emotions and starting a conversation with openness, you know, attracts openness. So, you know, you start a conversation being vulnerable. The first thing someone's going to do back to you is open up to you. I guarantee it. Um, I had times when I was going through the most remote places in Australia, talking to truck drivers on two ways. I could hear their conversations, talking to each other. They couldn't hear me. They'd be swearing to each other saying, what's this? you know, such and such riding his bike on these roads. But I'd jump on the two-way and I'd say, hey, mate, how are you going? He's like, oh, geez, didn't realise you were on the two-way. And, and, and like, oh, like within, you know, seconds, we're then talking about the struggles that they've had. Maybe they've, you know, the fact that they've lost someone dear to them. You know, I had a guy in Cape York tell me that he's that he's lost, he lost his daughter, you know, only a couple of years ago. And he said he's never spoken to, another person outside his family about that i had people talk to me that um have opened up for the first time in their life talking about the battles that they've had in their youth all the things that they struggle with every day um we all we all are able to help in lowering that stigma and um i think that stigma is there because we all put on an armor too much and um you know we need to learn to be able to to break that down and be more vulnerable in our conversations and, and create safe space for people to talk. Mm -hmm. I believe that, you know, that's what you guys are, are going to be doing. And I, you know, I commend you for it because we need it everywhere. Mm, absolutely. I think that's, that's a really important point. We need it everywhere. It can't just be, you know, in a little pocket that, that we're talking about this, it has to be a very normal conversation. Uh, and that's, you know, it's obviously part of what we're trying to achieve is normalizing this. For you, obviously, on the outside, it's very easy to say we need to talk about it. If you're suffering at the time from something like depression, that's a lot harder to actually do, isn't it? What, what would you say to somebody who, um, who maybe feels like they might be suffering something and is, is feeling uncomfortable talking about it? How would you go around advising them to, to and I appreciate you're not an expert in it, but from your own personal experience, what would you say to them to try and encourage them to open up? Yeah, for me, you know, I remember talking about this on the ride. I said, well, if, you know, put it to analogy. The first time I rode a bike, I, I've, you know, fell off a few times. Um, and it takes a while to get used to it and you got to practice it and get better at it just to be able to ride a bike. I put that the same with talking about what you're dealing with. The first time is maybe not going to work out the way you think it's going to work out. Um, but don't give up. It's the biggest thing is don't give up. And the same goes... If you're then going to see a psychologist, if you if you're going to tell someone in your family, um, the first person that you meet or the first time you try, um, it may not work, but try and change. Like the biggest thing is not be afraid to to say, well, it's not working with that person. It's, mm -hmm. it's not it's not you, and you're you're dealing with depression. You know, you're not depressed. You're dealing with something that that's passing through you. Um, and and I, I just think that um, you know, when you're in that position, you there's so many tools you can use now. It doesn't just have to be a, a pick up a phone and have a conversation with someone. It can be, but there's we have text back lines. There's there's phone calls, conversations that you can have with. Um, I, I know the people that we have in Australia. I'm not sure we got in the UK, yeah. but. Um, there's 24 seven crisis lines that you can talk to. It doesn't necessarily need to be your family because it can be very daunting because you're worried about how that affects them. But there's so many anonymous people you can talk to. And I think that's best because they're professionals. They're not going to be impacted by it. And I, I'd pick up the phone to them um, and have that conversation. But um, once you just say it for the first time, I guarantee you it'll, it'll lift a weight off your shoulders. But mm -hmm. if you don't get the reaction you're expecting, don't give up. That's the biggest thing is don't give up and try other avenues and try, try more people to talk mm -hmm. about it. Thank you. That's, that's great advice. And, 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 and obviously, um, Jace's journey was difficult for him. And one of the things that comes to mind for me is how chirpy and upbeat he was in public. And, and I guess dealing with it internally and then having to work so hard to not show that exacerbates the problem doesn't it yeah yeah it's exhausting you could see it on jace when he wasn't well he was he was generally exhausted 
and he was, you know, you could see, you could see in his eyes and, and, um, you know, I, I think I know myself when I'm even just overthinking things and, and, you know, the funny thing, the biggest thing for me was, you know, we're not only talking about depression, but we're talking about anxiety and I get really anxious oh, when I'd have interviews, you know, whether it be TV or radio because public or even public speaking, uh, um, for me was just so daunting, but it was that thing in, in one avenue was fronting up, fronting up for Jace doing it doing for everyone out there and, and, and knowing that I was the vessel you know it wasn't about what people thought of me but the biggest thing for me that worked was just breathing being present and just taking a breath and just concentrating on my breath and you know a lot of people talk about meditation um, as, as another way to, to help you know going through anxiety and depression and it works you know it's worked for me through going through you know anxious moments and anxiety and um, you know I know for Jace he, he found that through his sport. You know, that was his meditation. That was his way of centering himself. That was his way of, you know, finding his flow, going out and surfing, doing things that are, you know, you know, confidence for you. And um, my cathartic way through grieving was, you know, getting on that bike, getting energy, getting the endorphins going, just getting out of that road and, you know, thinking about the great times me and Jace had. So, you know, it's what worked for me and it's going to be different for everyone else. But, you know, find something that works for you. And, and I've, you know, I believe in sticking to a routine and I believe in physical exercise and, and, and talking about it and meditating and, you know, try everything, you know, don't just try one thing. If it doesn't work, do what works for you. It's really interesting to hear you talk about that connection between physical well-being and mental well-being as well, because they are so interlinked. And um, in Jace's story, it's there. Uh, you know, obviously, that, that when it got harder for him, there was an impact through physical with his back and that sort of stuff, not being able to do as much, and that 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 has an impact. And then on your story, helping you to to to, to process it and to to yeah. deal with the challenge you'd had. Um, for you, um, flipping the, the focus to you for a second that's a tough journey for anyone to deal with losing their, their their brother and somebody your relationship was so amazing and 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 um you know that that that's tough it's been a tough journey i know it's been a number of years now but there must have been some really difficult moments for you um on that journey since um since jace left us and um and and, and that's a challenge for you to have to deal with what have you done differently having seen jace go through that that maybe you wouldn't have done if you'd have gone through something like depression or anxiety without having been through that experience firsthand yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I always saw, you know, even before when Jace was going through that, that um, I felt quite in touch with my emotions. I felt that something that really helped me and I could see that Jace wasn't great at talking about his emotions and, and it made me tap into that a bit more. But what um, I suppose what I learned a lot about that is, um, you know, along the, road, along the road, I had to face a lot of things that were fearful in my life, you know riding on a road with road trains coming past you at 130 k's an hour. I was shit scared of that, you know, when I was um, riding around. And, and, and as I said, public speaking, talking in front of, you know, I went, one of my first talks I did was in front of my old high school. There's a thousand kids sitting there. And I was like, you know, what am I, what am I doing here? You know, I remember, I remember chatting to Kat before I went out onto, um, onto stage and I was, I was going through um, what I was talking about. And I got to the part where my mother rang me to tell me, Jace, wasn't here anymore I, I couldn't I just couldn't get past it and you know I think what, what I've what I learned about that journey and and um you know having lost Jace is that you know sometimes and in, in that moment when I was delivering something that it was you know it was this was this is bigger than me you know what, what I'm a part of here is is bigger than me and you know I need to get out there I need to front up and I need to show up and, and just just having that just having that thing of like when we did the ride is just showing up like let's just show up you know let's let's the first thing to do is just show up and the, and the rest will flow for me so just taking that deep breath and being present i think you know it's come out it's come of a funny way out of it but being present and being in the moment for me works best with any conversation you're having you know and it works works so well for the person who's on the other side of that who's maybe seeking help is if you can be present for them um they're going to get so much more out of it and you're going to get so much more out of it and you know listening so much you know uh, is just like key when you're trying to help someone and you know i got i got that out of it and i continue to get so much out of it because i'm involved in the mental health space a lot more now so you know i've, I've gained i've gained a lot um out of doing what i've done for jace um yeah 
since and since it passed. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And and for for those in our audience who maybe uh, aren't suffering from something like anxiety or depression or whatever it might be themselves, but maybe feel that somebody in their family or one of their loved ones or maybe one of their colleagues at work is, and they perhaps identified that they've got a gut feeling uh, or or you know a, 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 an instinct that that might be happening. What would you say to them? What would you say to them in terms of how they should deal with that? Should they approach the conversation? Should they, um, could that, can they support somebody at that stage? Because I think one of the challenges is people identifying it in themselves and being able to either admit or actually identify that that's the challenge that they're facing at that point in time. So what, what can we do to help those around us that are maybe suffering from depression, anxiety or something similar? Yeah, um, I'm definitely not a professional in the field, but I, I have done I've done a suicide first aid course that I've used in, in my construction industry. And one of the big things I learned out of that was the, the, um, the, the stigma around talking about suicide. Um, and, and the, the bad facts that are out there that you can, that you can put suicide in someone's mind. Um, if they're going through or thinking about taking their own life, it's going to take a while to get up that. It took me a bit going through a course to do it, but you can talk to them about it. You can actually ask someone and it's probably the best thing you can do for someone. If you really worry about them is ask them, are they thinking about taking their own life? And just asking that uh, you can understand whether you need to put them in a safe place. You can understand whether you need to get them the help that they need. Um, and it gives you a lot of confidence to just to know that, by saying that you can't put it in someone's mind, it's been proven that, that that's not going to put it in someone's mind. Um, and also picking up on the signs and symptoms. So, you know, what we learned through that is that someone just all of a sudden, you know, takes up gambling, takes up drinking, or they were a heavy drinker and they stopped, or they were in a relationship and it just stopped all of a sudden for no reason. And it's just having those conversations and it's, you know, it's asking about listening, you know, it's, it's asking a question, but really wanted to hear what they're going through and, and, you know, picking up when someone's quiet, someone's a bit different at work, someone's, you know, not having those usual conversations and, you know, they feel a little bit within themselves. Just check up on them, check up and make sure they're okay. And, and if you're really, really worried about them, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask, harder questions in a safe place, like make it safe for them, make sure it's, you know, just you and them, but often asking the hard questions and, and, and asking them something like that. The first time they talk about it, you, what's the release they have about that? You know, whether they have been thinking about it, um, they have never actually said it themselves, but um, as soon as they can say it, they can get the help they need. You know, mm. they can, you can point them in the right direction and they can, you know, seek out that help. Mm. And and obviously that, that that that's from your opinion. You knew Jace better than anybody else in in the world. Um, what what would what what would Jay say about the journey you've been on over the last what is it four or five years? Uh, yeah, I'd imagine he'd be immensely proud of everything that you've done. What would what what do you think he'd say to you today if he could? I think about the ride. He'd probably say I'm an idiot because um, <laughs> he's a bit of a joke star. And um, why'd you dress up in lycra for? A, six months and ride around the country. Yeah, you could have gone in a <laughs> car just, or anything. And you chose a why don't you just take her ashes and drive, man? Why? <laughs> um, no, I know we'd be meant to be proud. We, we gave each other a lot of crap over the years, but, um, you know, we were definitely very proud of each other in, in, in our achievements. And, um, you know, going around Australia, you know, Chase gave me his little signals that, that I picked up on the things that, you know, that meant a lot to me. And, um, yeah, I know, I know not just me, you know, not just, just my journey, but, um, but all his mates, the family, you know, the way that we've all come together to, to get through this collectively as a group and, you know, my relationship with my wife, how she's supported me immensely, you know, our young little family that we've got now and the way that, you know, we want to bring those kids up and make sure that they get the opportunities and they feel, you know, confident and comfortable within themselves to talk about their emotions and their feelings, you know. I think collectively as, you know, as, as Jace's, you know, group, family, friends, everyone, he'd be so proud of, you know, I, I think you're seeing, you know, I'm seeing so many more conversations amongst mates, you know, our football team, our old football team, our, you know, um, my group of mates that we grew up in Cost Harbour, um, 
you know, the family, there's so many more conversations about mental health that I'm seeing. And I know he'd be immensely proud of, proud of that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah, he absolutely would be. And, and, and let's just talk about the journey. So you talked about the fact that you go, what on earth are you doing that for, you, you idiot? And I think um, knowing Jace, I think that's a fairly, uh, fairly accurate uh, phrase that I would hear coming yeah. out of now. Um, <laughs> Why did you choose to write it? So your your dream and one of the things you and Jay talked about was going around Australia. I get that, yeah. but why on a yeah. bike? Yeah, he, yeah, his dream wasn't on a bike. Let me no. clear that up. Uh, <laughs> his would have been like, let, let's go, let's go surfing, let's go fishing, let's take cars. Um, for me, I, I knew that um, we we really needed to to get attention of people. If you got to make an impact out there, um, I knew that. Um, I wanted to do something extraordinary for Jace. I wanted to show him this country and I didn't want to rush it. I didn't want to get out on the, on the road and, and, and zoom past so many places, but, um, physically, I think I needed to, to get out, out there for myself. And I knew that in the grieving process, that was going to be great for me. And, you know, there was a bit of a, a selfish component in there. And, but the thing that I, I took from that is I needed to do that for myself so I could be the better person that I, needed to be at that time for everyone around me for all those that um you know jason's family and friend that are also that also lost him um and you know if we could get the exposure we could get the attention then you know that attention could just come in and, and put into mental health and, and saving someone else out there so um if i drove around australia i don't think i would have got the same same eyes on me um uh, and and the same attention so so writing um on these very barren roads with road trains going past, yeah, that, that got the attention that we needed. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And, um, absolutely bonkers, but amazing. Um, and, and, uh, I would imagine, uh, you're right that the, the, the doing it in a car probably wouldn't have had the same level of impact. <laughs> what impact Amazing. did it have? So I know one of your big drivers was fundraising. How much did you raise on that journey? Yeah. So our first goal, um, was raising, I think around 50,000, um, and before we even set out on the ride, we raised uh, 150,000. So it was, it was pretty extraordinary. Um, and we ended up saying, well, if we can raise 150 before the ride, let's double it and try and raise 300,000 before, before we finish. And yeah, so many, so many people put out their hand. We had some amazing sponsors um, jump on board. And, and the more people you know, that got on board meant that the, the ripple effect was happening with talking about mental health and lowering the stigma. The more people that touched it. And you know, I'd be more happy to get, you know, 300,000 people donating a dollar because that's more people um, getting behind the cause and more people spreading the word. And, and it was like that. It was, it was so many people donating um, small amounts, big amounts, but you know, on, when you, when you get that money coming in, it's not only money going towards, you know, a charity that we really believe in, but it's also people obviously thinking about it and talking about it. Mm, absolutely. And that, that money was for the black dog Institute over there in Australia, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, the Black Dog Institute um, had an had immediate connection with them. I, I mean, it's it's strange. You, you really you really into and behind everything they do, and their you know their research facility. Um, they're they're into knowledge transfer, so they so they use their science and research base to to do community um, programs. And that for me, that you know, that's for me that's tangible. You know, that they're getting real facts, and and they're making sure they transfer those into into you know people in the community but the, the first thing for me was picking up the phone ringing the guy from black dog and that first conversation we have a two-hour conversation about loss i was talking about his loss that he's had in his family and my loss and just having that bond and and that whole institute um feels to this day like a family to me i've been to so many events that they've had and and um i've been to the headquarters in sydney and um you know when you walk in the room and it's, it's, basically most of them are scientists and they welcome you like a family, you know, you're on the right track and they have, they have that, that in mind that they want, you know, they want everyone to be a part of their family. So that's, yeah. Yeah. The best, best charity to be involved with. Yeah. Fantastic. They, and they, they, they do some amazing stuff and um, obviously they, they inspired you with the work that they did. So it's so, um, amazing to, to see you raising so much money for them on that journey, Ben, you must've had some pretty dark moments, both emotionally and physically but i know there's one particular moment very early on in the, the ride that that i guess complicated things a little bit tell us about that yeah yeah so um it was only 10 days into the ride and i was actually riding with a with a work colleague who's from our construction company in brisbane and um 
yeah, it's, you know, we set out that morning, it was, it was beautiful weather and, um, I don't know, we were doing probably about 40 k's on a pretty, pretty main road. Um, we got to set of traffic lights and, um, yeah, someone just cut us off and at 40 or I don't know, by the time we put on the brakes, maybe 35 k's an hour, I did front flip over the bonnet and my mate did like a synchronized little couple of seconds later front flip and I hit the road, my bike landed on me, he landed on me and then, um, and then, yeah, basically sat there on the road and thinking that, um, I want to get back up and continue this ride, but I couldn't move. Um, had the ambulance come. Luckily enough, I didn't do too much damage. I tore um, every ligament in my left shoulder. That was a grade five craniocravical separation. Um, and I had about, oh, I mean, initially the, the surgeon told me it's going to be six months on the sideline and I was devastated. Um, all I worried, was worried about is getting trying to get back on that bike that that afternoon. But he said, "Mate, if you can, see, if you were able to see your shoulder right now, there's no way you'll get back on that bike." Um, you know, I, I had surgery the next day, and um, yeah, I managed to get back on the bike in two months. So it was yeah, it was really good. I mean, I, I had nothing else to do except recover and and work on it. It was just a, a very um, crazy serendipity moment that one of Jason's best mates lived. You know, 45 minutes away and he was a exercise physiologist and he treated me for all that time and you know i went to him as well get me back on the bike so quick <laughs> so did you have to go back to the point at which you'd uh, been knocked off to start again a hundred percent yeah <laughs> and um yeah just getting back there on the bike and looking down at that um intersection of where i laid it on the floor there yeah, it, was, it was a little bit daunting um and that same that same mate, he felt so terrible. It wasn't his fault, but for some reason he was beating himself up about. I said, "Man, it's, it's got nothing to do with you." He joined me again. He, he supported me again that day. And to his credit, he, you know, he was involved in the crash as well. Um, he, um, yeah, he rode with me that day. It's great support. Amazing. And and I, I think I know the answer to this. But what was it that drove you to get back? Because a lot of people would have got knocked down and maybe not got back up again, and certainly not in in the way that you did so quickly. What yeah. what what drove you to think? You know what? This is this was crazy. It's now even more crazy. But I'm going to carry on anyway. Yeah. Um. My my mind never went the other way. It was very crazy. It, it never ever said you know this is going to go. And and a few people said to me, oh you know let's go let's go back home, you know, do you want to go back home for two months and then pick it back up? You know, we're talking, we're talking 10 hours driving north of, north of where we started in Sydney is where, where I had the crash. Um, it was just inside Queensland, it's a thousand kilometers from where we started. Um, but for me, you know, obviously Jace was, was, just, was huge motivation. And, you know, I was, I, as I said before, I was never going to give up on him life and, and, you know, having someone just knock me off the bike, that wasn't going to stop me, you know, I was going to do whatever I could for Jace, but just having the support of, you know, everyone that was watching the ride, everyone that donated, everyone that was behind it, um, the Black Dog Institute, all those people out there suffering. And, you know, I just kept reliving in my mind the, the suffering that Jace went through. I said, you know, I can't let someone else's, someone else, you know, see that in a family member. I can't let someone else suffer like that, you know. So a physical injury for me, I'm just going to, you know, I've got to suck it up and get it back out there. Mm. Yeah. And that there would have been some some dark physical moments, I'd imagine, when you were riding over sand dunes and probably going yeah. at very little speed and not getting anywhere yeah. and where you'd probably have blisters and a sore ass and all the rest oh, of it, yeah. um, riding oh, around yeah. and, and and some 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 real mental challenges in doing that as as is, is normal with a physical challenge like that. Tell us about yeah. some of those moments where you had to to really pull some resilience out the bag and get through it. Yeah, um, it's funny. You think, oh, the long days, and I did some, I did some extremely long days, and I did some, some extremely hard days in heat. You know, I've had days of, I think the hottest day was fifty-five degrees. But Western Australia, there was so many days in the forties. Um, but the hardest was the combination of the headwind. The headwind was the hardest because the headwind, and a lot of a lot of the roads in Australia are very straight, and they head one direction. Um, so when you had a headwind, you had it for the whole day. Um, and I would, you know, I would average you know, probably around 30 k's an hour. And those days, you know, I was, I was low 20s and it was just exhausting. It just felt like it was never going to end. And, you know, I'd look for, for you know, as far as I could on the weather maps to see. Uh, wind was what I checked every morning and I saw a week of headwinds. It was, yeah, it was, it was pretty down. <laughs> it was pretty dark times. But, um, yeah, you know, again, I had, I had to dig deep and, and keep telling myself the reasons that I'm there. But, you know, lucky enough, I had my, my wife. 
you know, who was following me in the camper van and I had, I had my mum who was following in a caravan um, with her partner. You know, I really drew on their strength. I really drew on and the fact that just, just firsthand seeing their support and knowing that um, the support that they're giving me is the same support everyone else is giving me out there who was following the ride. Um, and with all those guys on, on top of me and, and pushing me, you know, how, how could I not get through those days? And um, yeah, I, I never, as again, I never, I never thought of giving up, but um, yeah, I had to dig deep. And if you do, and, and when, when I did dig deep and get through the end of the ride, you know, it's such an achievement. And mm. that only gives you more motivation that the next day or the next time it is hard for you that you know, um, you know how to get out of it. Yeah, interesting to hear you talk a couple of times about how you never went the other way with your mindset, and obviously you're you're, you're yeah. fortunate enough that you've got a strong mind and you 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 were, you were committed to that journey. What, were there any moments where you thought you were going to fail? I mean, I guess when you were knocked off and you realised you needed surgery, there's a there's a practical thought of what does this mean. But were there any moments yeah, yeah. where you hit that dark? Geez, I'm just uh, there's no way I can do this. Yeah, of course, and there was. Um... Uh, there was there, there was times in that moment when I did have that crash where, where I was um, where I was thinking, well, you know, not not necessarily that I wasn't going to do it, but it, well, there was times when I was thinking, it's like, what's going to be like when I have that truck come past me for the for the first time again? You know, what, what's it going to be like when, when I'm back out there? And it's they're they're, they're pretty scary moments and it's very fearful moments. Um, but it was that thing I told myself of just showing up, you know. Um, is just you know just getting back on the bike and, and and showing up and i just knew that i had to do that not only for myself but for everyone around me but um you know, at the end of the day you, you need to be thinking you need to be thinking about yourself i knew that this ride was going to be cathartic for me and i knew if i gave up i, I wouldn't be in a good state i, I knew that um I wouldn't feel great about it. I'd feel very hard on myself, and I'd I'd, I'd not in, I'd not enjoy that. Um, I guess I guess the big thing for me is I knew it was good for me. I knew it was good for me to to tackle those battles and, and get through the other side. And I grew strength on that. And as much as it is for so many people out there, it was it was a big thing for me. And um, you know, when you're going through your personal battles, you've got to have some love for yourself. You've got to have some you got to have some 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 ticker for yourself and know that you are worth it. Um, Obviously, you're not going to think that when you when you're in a dark when you're in a dark time. But um, look at those people around you, you know, uh, and lean on those people around you because they, they know you're worth it. Mm. And it's interesting because at the end of the the, the, the story or, or after that ride, as uh, so to speak, it's easy for for the the normal average Joe like me to look at you that doesn't know you and say, yeah, but he's obviously an amazing cyclist anyway. This is something that he was set up to do. He's, he's made a bit differently. But I'll always remember a conversation I had with you oh, years before this all happened when we were on a training run for football. We used to play football together. And I said, how are you so fit? Because you're always a good runner. And you said, I wasn't yeah. actually that way. It's up here. I've had to push myself through that. So that mental strength has always been there. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, I'm trying to emphasise the point that you're just a normal guy. It's not like you are yeah. an Olympic athlete anyway, is it? Cycling something you've always yeah. enjoyed and done it but at an amateur level. Yeah. You, 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 yeah. Anybody can do something like this if they put their mind to it, right? Yeah, hundred percent. That going around Australia wasn't a race, and I, it was very hard to train for. You say, "Well, yeah, we're going to do. You're going to ride 150 k's average a day." Um, and, and even if you said, "Well, this is a guy who's, who's very physically strong and, and you know has very fitness," you've got so many things, elements. You're coming up. You, you're riding in 45 degree heat. You're riding in headwinds. You're riding past road trains, doing 130 k's an hour. There's there's so many things out there. But yeah, I definitely wasn't. Um, I, I'm not a. I'm not a you know, A grade cyclist, uh, you know, at the end of it, I was, you know, probably up there, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more about the drive to, to do something for someone and, and for a cause. Um, you never know what's going to come out of you when you, when you're faced with tragedy, um, or face, face with, you know, adversity. Um, and, you know, before Jace passed, if I had told myself, well, I'm going to go around, I don't, I wouldn't have made it. I, I don't think I would have, I don't know. I don't know whether I would have the motivations personally to to take myself for, to ride around Australia. But um, I drew so much strength from from Jace and, and wanting to help help support um, others out there and wanting to do this for a cause. And it's it's amazing the human strength and, and amazing what your body what your body is capable of. Um, and you know, you, you tell me during this interview that I'm crazy. Oh, I know 100. I, I, I know you owe, and I know I know that. Um, 
if if you wanted to you could do this i know 100 percent. you know you could do this i know that um people don't know their own strength and until you need it and um you know that that's what that's what it did for me Mm. And, and you you touched on um I'll, I'll, I'll we'll have to agree to just disagree on that i'm not quite sure i could get all the way around <laughs> australia i'd maybe get to queensland and, and that'll be that <laughs> you, you touched on the finish and the that experience i i can't imagine that i mean you know competing in a an amateur you know a half marathon or something like that is emotional enough when you're physically drained and you finish something and you feel that sense of pride and achievement add into that your motivation for doing this jace's story the fact that you had jace's ashes with you on the journey and he he had completed that journey with you add the the, the sheer um the sheer greatness of the achievement in terms of physical um distance that you cycled and time that you committed to it and all the stuff that happened on the journey describe for me that 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 emotion when you got back to manly and crossed the finish line and uh, in front of the beach there with I don't know how many people there, hundreds, hundreds or thousands of people there to cheer you in and to say that the news and the media there. Wow, I can't imagine what that felt like. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was I was coming towards the end of the ride because the ride was such a long, was like such a long journey. It was 193 days um, on the bike. Was making sure I, I I took that moment in, and a lot of the time in days leading up to that, I was like, I've got to lean into the joy here. I've got to lean into you know what what the achievement is what it's all about every, everything you just said um and it was about that going back to being present you know and that was it was the best way i was going to be able to express myself to the media and to people out there and to get more backing behind mental health and, and well-being and, and lowering that stigma so i was really really concentrated and I, I taught myself a lot about that you know going around um, not only doing the talks but then being out on the bike and just you know going through meditative states and trying to be present and in that moment and um one of the big things was you know don't 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 pass up this opportunity you know you're about to walk into so many people that um have experienced tragedy and you know you're a part of turning that to a positive for a lot of people and um i think yeah it's, it's a moment and um a time when i came in there that um one of the greatest greatest things in my life um I remember I rode in there with my cousin, you know, he, he, instead of doing the whole leg of the last day, he just rode from the top of the hill. So he's a bit of a cop out, but, um, you know, even, even him getting down to the bottom with me and, you know, there was, there was, there was a few other people that, um, rode the last day or rode from the top of the hill and, you know, him just putting his hand on his shoulders and, um, him just telling me, I think I'm going to cry, you know, and then, um, in that moment we both just shed a tear and, you know, it's just all that build up of, um, yeah everything that you said and everything that was that was behind it and um yeah a big thing for me it was it was funny but a big thing was me for me was making sure that we had the exposure and i was i was um i was so worried coming into the day as oh, i hope we get the, the interviews i hope we get the radio down there how we get the tv I hope nobody would people. turn up oh well, we don't know, <laughs> you know <laughs> you're, you're out by yourself most of the time when you ride around australia you don't see that many people and um yeah you, know, you, you see it online and stuff but you just hope that um i don't know it was, it, was, it was such a such an opportunity and it was the it was the pinnacle of of the trip to to grab that attention so i was heavily focused on that but every now and then i had to pinch myself and bring myself back and say no you need to you need to really you know lean into the lean into the joy be, and be so grateful and I, I couldn't have i couldn't have um experienced that joy without being grateful grateful for all the support grateful for my wife you know coming the whole way around and support me you know to no end um, my mum um, and just just what we'd all created you know a, a massive community with a you know with a positive attitude towards helping people after tragedy you know so um it was huge and yeah sucked yeah. up every, every moment i could you've touched on this point a number of times maybe maybe without realizing it but it's that connection with people isn't it so you've talked about the yeah. fact that you couldn't have got around that physical journey without jace and the, the motivation of jace and without your your, your mum and her partner and your wife on the road with you and um i think that 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 rings true all the way through your story it's the connection with people and the loved ones and the relationships you have with people and that 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 network of support that was so important for for jace when he was suffering and and and, and obviously is it for anybody suffering with anything it's that network of support that will get you through something uh, whether it's a physical challenge like you have or a, or a psychological psychological challenge that, that that you might be suffering um and obviously you've, you're lucky enough to have some 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 really supportive people in your family who were behind you all the way yeah. through that 
Um, yeah, you know, you hit the nail on the head with connection. Like that's it. Though. Like you know, everyone wants to be wants to be loved and to be heard. You know, and if you can if you can think about that when you when you're you know in a battle with someone, in an argument with someone, or you see someone that's down, or you see someone that needs support, everyone as much as you crave to be loved and heard, so does everyone else. So, you know, you've, you know, you've, you've hit it right there with connection. And it is, and that whole journey was about human connection and getting, getting out of a hole is about human connection. Mm. Um, I highly doubt everyone's, anyone's ever going to get out of a hole just by sitting by themselves and then wake up the next morning and everything will be all right. It doesn't work that way. Mm. It's talking to each other, it's communicating. It's, it's, you know, turning to your network and, and, and getting the things that you're internalizing out and yeah, exactly right. The, the human connection on the ride and, and, um, and, and yeah, you know, what we experienced coming into Manly and the support we had was, you know, was what made it easy in a way. <laughs> and what made you get rid of the beard that you managed to grow on the ride? Cause that was one impressive <laughs> ginger beard that you had going on there, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was the wife. Um, she, she, um, she sort of gave me an ultimatum. She said, "If we raise three hundred thousand, you got to get rid of the beard." And I said, "Yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll do that." And uh, <laughs> it, it was it was a bittersweet moment. <laughs> nah, it was an amazing moment to raise the money. So I was quite happy to get rid of the beard. But um, I think one of the, one of my mates said to me uh, very early on the ride. He said, "Don't shave the beard, and I'll and I'll and I'll put some big money behind you." So I thought, "Yeah, okay." I'll do that. <laughs> good on you. Good on you. Nearly, nearly dragging it on the floor as you came over the finish line, wasn't oh, it? Oh, mate. Yeah, it caught a lot of food in it. I it was, it was proper that. Forrest Gump <laughs> moment, wasn't it? Um, and, and obviously one of the one of the um, the most difficult things, I guess, about the, the story for you and for, for Kat, your wife, was the fact that you were getting married just a couple of months after Jace took his, his life. And I, I guess that must have been, a, 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 if not the, one of the most difficult days for you following that. And um, and at the same time, such a wonderful, uh, wonderful day in your journey and your life. You talked about bittersweet early, earlier. Uh, yeah. Talk me through how that that how that day panned out for you in terms of your your emotional journey, because that must have been tough to take. Yeah, I think um, I think yeah, it was massive. You know, it was, it was extremely emotional. Jace, <laughs> when I found out, I, I uh, or when I sorry when it, when I when I told Jace and rang him up and told him I was engaged two years prior to us getting married, you know, he was the one that told me that um, he's going to be my best man. <laughs> he, 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 he knew where he stood. He knew he was my best mate. Um, but um, yeah, th that day was, you know, it was, it was extremely emotional, but in the same token, it was, it was, a, it was, it was an amazing thing. It was that um, our family could get together for a positive experience after having such a tragedy. You know, it was a positive experience. It was an emotional experience, but, it was something we could all be together again and, and celebrate something. And, um, you know, you, you felt him there, you felt everyone, everyone just seems so connected, you know, through that bond of Jace, you know, just about everyone there knew him. Um, but, uh, everyone was there for, for, for also an amazing experience. So it was, yeah, it, it was actually, it was actually a very positive thing to have the wedding. I think it was, mm. it was very good to, for everyone to have that, um, gathering where we could celebrate something um so it was yeah it was, it was good yeah and and um one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about is obviously you've suffered from great loss and people um have probably dealt with talking to you about it in different ways um and particularly you know in, in, in immediately after that happens people often don't know what to say or how to approach things having been through that experience um, what would you say to people who may be um, uh, uh, surrounded by or, or, or with people or connected to people that lose somebody that they love? What would you say to them in terms of how to approach that conversation? Because um, I know that that's one of the things that people find most difficult is to, what do I say and how do I, how do I talk to this person who's had such a terrible loss? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very interesting um, talk about that. I, I had a mate who lost his brother uh, a few years before I lost Jace, and I remember the the day um, Jace passed. He, he rings me up, and um, you know I was very very close mates with, with him. You know I knew his brother, but you know I wasn't real close mates with with his brother. But um, when he when he rang me, I just I just said, Danny, I'm so sorry, man. I, I never. I never spoke to you 
when you about your brother you know when you lost him I'm, I'm so sorry about that you know because here i am you know i've lost jason he's ringing me up to see how i am um and he's you know he's like don't you know don't apologize about it and i suppose having gone through losing jace and you get all those conversations of support it's it, you then realize that um you know, shouldn't be fearful about this i shouldn't be fearful about talking to someone who was just 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 lost someone um and ringing ringing someone up just to say you're there is is the best thing you can do um you know that all those thoughts that run through your head should i ring them should i not should i ring them should i not um you know that's that's you worrying about you know what you know you're going to say the wrong thing you're going to do all that you, you can't you can't worry about that you you just got to worry about the first and foremost thing of being there for them you know if you're a friend to them if you're a family member to them it's just picking up that phone and saying listen I'm here for you and we're going to get through this together, you know, be on their team, be on their side and, and make it make it as if it's not a battle or a grief or something that they're going through themselves, you know, to say, I'm here to talk whenever you need to. And I'm here to, you know, to get through this with you. Yeah. Mm. And, and final question, if you don't mind, um, what, what, what can, uh, what can we do as a society and as people, to um, to support the, the 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 campaign to normalise um, the discussion around things like depression and mental health and anxiety, we talked about opening the conversation. As as individuals, we can do certain things, and if if there's ever a good example, it's you to go and do something so extreme and to raise so much money. But as a society, what do you think needs to change to to, to normalise that and to, to to help the cause? Yeah, it's hard. It's it's that's a. Uh, uh, the, in the right position to, to guide a society to tell them what to do. But, um, you know, as I said before, I, I'm big on telling my personal experience because I think it's the way people connect. Um, I know that, um, through the black dog, they have lived, lived experience people that, that do talks and they find that is the biggest connection. You know, the biggest connection that people have is listening to a lived experience because it's the way that they can relate to it you know they're seeing raw emotion of someone talking about their lived experience whether it be through losing someone or whether it be someone who's who's happy and willing to talk about their anxiety or or their you know depression um and hats off to those people that are battling something or have battled something and they can talk about it um you know, as a society, we need to know yes we need to normalize that it's okay to talk about this and we don't even need to always come out and talk about the part you know, you know only talk about depression or anxiety when we're uh, when we've overcome it or believe we've overcome it um to normalize conversations to be okay for someone to talk about what they're going through right now is what we need to do um and i saw that when jace passed that we had people who near and dear to us that we didn't know they were struggling with anything actually talk about well i'm going through something right now mm -hmm. And when someone says something like that, you know, hold a safe space for them. Um, and, you know, I think when we talk about like as a society, what we can do and people might say, well, the government could do this or the government could do that, or, you know, this charity should be promoted more. And I always just think it comes back to the individual, you know, none of that happens unless the individual is going to be able to, hold a safe space for someone be able to show their vulnerabilities be able to you know put their hand up and say i'm, I'm willing to help you know the battles and everything that we're going through right now um with you know this COVID 19 is you know the only way people get through it is to help each other this just this story i'm just gonna add in there that i heard today is that this this guy you know he um he walks into this room and um uh, and it's called long spoons right so he walks into a room and and he's really hungry he's been starving for days and in this room is just this massive table full of food and um everyone in that room has got a really long spoon and that's all they got to feed themselves and um you know they they're all starving they can't feed themselves because they can't get the spoon into their mouth it's too long um and he's like, oh, it's, wait, before he walked in, he could smell it. He thought this was the best place. And anyway, he he um, he walks into the next room. Before he gets there, he goes, mate, you've just experienced hell. And then he walks into the next room and um, everyone's jovial. Everyone's cheering. Everyone's happy. They seem like they're fed. 
but he walks into the room, there's empty bowls and there's still long spoons. And he's like, well, what's the difference here? And he goes, mate, you just walked into heaven. And he's like, well, I just walked into the same room with a table with long spoons. And, you know, and he goes, the difference is people here are feeding each other, you know? And I think that's, that's, yeah, that, that story just resonates so much because the only way we get out of it is if we feed each other and help each other, you know, we're all battling certain things in our life. Um, and, you know, if we sit there and only want to take, 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 then, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to pan out for everyone as, as a society. But if we can give when we feel good, we can take when we feel bad and don't be afraid to pull your hand up and, and take when you feel bad, but mm. give when you feel good and give when you can. Yeah, amazing. And, and, and I like, as I said, I had one last question and, and thank you for that story because I, I, you're right, it resonates a bit. It re resonates with me as well. And it's, it's fascinating to, 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 to see such a simple example of how working together and supporting each other can make such a, such a difference. Um, I, I like, as I've got one more question, which was yeah, um, right. obviously on your journey, there's one other amazing thing which happened, which was that you and your wife Kat um, became pregnant on the, on the ride around Australia. So you obviously weren't completely out of energy. Um, no. and, um, and, and at some point on that journey found out that that was the case and, um, and have two beautiful young girls as twins uh, nonetheless. Yeah. Um, and I guess for you, a hell of a lot changed in the space of a year or two there of your life or a year, year and a bit of your, your life, didn't it? And um, that must have added to the, 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 the way in which you remember that whole experience and journey that you've been on in such a wonderful way. Yeah. And there's two parts of that story, you know, that I want to grab from that, from that is, um, is one that I'm glad you brought it up because it relates to very much to what you're doing. But the first part is, you know, obviously experiencing that while we're on the road, I think we we're in the, the middle of the Nullarbor and I drove, I rode past Kat and she's usually in the car cheering me on and, you know, always backing me and she was just sitting in the car when I rode in the camper van. I was like, something's up. And anyway, get to the next stop. She's got a massive smile on her face and she goes, I'm pregnant. And, Man, I got back on that bike and I screamed like nothing else because no one was around. I just thought this is the best. <laughs> and um, you know, when we got into when we got into Manly, um, no one knew obviously that that she was pregnant. And um, it was only two days after that that we found out that they were twins. And yeah, you know, it's crazy to just think that you know, we can go through life and, and have battles by ourselves, but to to have this and to, to be gifted with twins and have each other for the rest of their life was just incredible. And to see them grow now and to see them, you know, they're 20 months now and start to talk and communicate with themselves, just maybe mumbling, but I think they understand what's going on between each other. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's, I don't know. There's some, there's some gift there. There's some, something that Jace did for us to, to see that, you know, we're going to bring up people that, that have each other. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other thing to that is, is, is the physical side. Um, I went from, you know, riding 150 Ks a day, um, you know, on average four to five days a week. Um, and I was extremely fit and I felt so good inside of myself. Um, and it's the thing that you, you guys that uh, are reaching out to those that, that have not nine to fives, you know, they've got jobs beyond that or they, they push themselves to work beyond that. Um, I came back to the construction industry and, um, I thought that I'd move into, I may move into um, mental health or something in that avenue. But um, the first thing I day I sat down and, uh, and I was in the smoke I shed and I said, man, there's, there's so much I need to do here. You know, there's so much I, I can do here. But just going back into working long hours again um, and then having twins, you can imagine what happened to my physical exercise. You know, yeah. <laughs> it took a, took a drop, priorities take over and um, that has been a hard time for me. Um, getting through that has been quite difficult, but I had to, I had to change the way I get my exercise, the way I get my endorphins or the way I, you know, I get, I get my release in the day and, and I've um, changed doing running and I've changed doing short runs and, and a bit more high intensity, but um, it works for me, you know, like cattle know if I, if I'm a bit stressed or, and we pick up on vibes from each other and it's like, just, just, you know, take, take 15 minutes, take 20 minutes, just go for a run. Mm. instantly i come back i'm a different person you know cat can talk to me and she's like oh, i want to talk about this and i said look i agree with you we need to talk about it but let me just go for a run i'll be a much better person when i get back and it's so true um so so true and i remember even when i was um when i was finishing the ride there was there was times there when i didn't even have 15 minutes 20 minutes but before i got in the house i knew it was going to be mayhem i knew that when i get in there i need to be there for cat you know i can't just come in there and tell about my problems in the day 
um, I'd meditate, you know, I'd meditate for five minutes and that was, that was good for me. It did wonders for me. Um, there was times there where, where I saw a um, psychologist and that helped me so much, you know, as there's, there's, there's different ways that I could do it and there's different ways that I could get it out in a short time that, um, you know, sometimes life doesn't give you three hours to ride on a bike most of the time it won't. <laughs> so but, true, um, so and yeah. how important it is, how important it is as a parent to set a good example and to be able to exactly. be so present and aware of your own emotions that you yeah. can you can talk about them comfortably, you can open up about your 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 journey and your emotions and your 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 your, your imperfections as a human being as a, and as a yeah. as a, a role model for your um for your kids, but also be aware of that of that, that that requirement to stay physically fit and physically active, yeah. Um, yeah. and the importance of that, and linking it back to how important it is as, as a parent, because you've got to set a good example, haven't you? So. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, definitely, exactly what you said. Owen. you can't look after them without looking at yourself, no. and you, yeah, you've got to be a team in that. You've got to yeah, you've got to take those moments to to get out there and whatever your release is, you know, make mm. sure you do it. Yeah, yeah amazing. Well, look, Ben, um, thank you so much. I'm conscious it's late at night there and I've got you uh, awesome. got you in the evening after probably a full day's work. So um, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're a, you're a true inspiration. Um, and, and as you rightly said, Jace would be hugely proud of you. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful for you being open about your emotional journey, about Jace's story um, and about your such amazing uh, achievement. And um, let's say congratulations on your, your world record. I don't think it'll be... Uh, be anytime soon anybody beats that and I, I'm just trying to think about I'll have to work it out how many times somebody would have to ride around the UK to break that record <laughs> they'd be around it several times wouldn't they but uh, yeah. thankfully you didn't have to worry at least you had a bit of a variety on the way and didn't have to keep going over trodden tracks yeah no thanks man um thanks for any opportunity I get to be able to talk about my brother I love because uh, mm. I hold love for him yeah. always and forever and yeah. um any opportunity to, to help out when someone's trying to do stuff for mental health and well-being i'm, I'm right behind you know it's a, it's definitely a passion of mine um so yeah man thanks thanks for the call great to talk to you um and don't yeah, doubt that you couldn't ride around the uk yeah, yeah. Run. <laughs> yeah it's a short <laughs> ride i could probably do that <laughs> one thing i would say i'd like to share um, people you know, um, won't know Jason, um, but I, my memory of him, my, my funniest memory of him was when we did what was in Australia is called Fridge to Fridge. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a it's a several kilometre run and every roughly kilometre we stop on someone's driveway and have to put down a beer and then carry on running. I wouldn't um, put it in the well-being category necessarily, <laughs> but our football team or soccer team, <laughs> call it there used to do that every year in pre-season and yeah. I, we used to do it in fancy dress and i'll never forget jason doing that pretty much naked with a, a see-through can't even remember what it was like it was a see-through uh, raincoat it rain was a hat it was a hat with a flap and i'm pretty sure he had a last to pass yeah. um i don't know what you guys call it but <laughs> the, yeah, like the, the strapping tape wasn't it yeah um, yeah. <laughs> yeah and it was uh it was it was quite a moment seeing him run, run past the family in the street dressed yeah, like that. yeah no running yeah running past the shops and i think it was a family there that yeah definitely faces turned um but that yeah. was jace and that's how I remember him. It's the joker, the, 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 the real, you know, life and soul. And, um, yeah. and that's how we should remember him is, is, is yeah, yeah. things. Um, but Ben, yeah. thanks, thanks for joining us. Thanks for talking so openly. And, um, and, and, and it's been a real pleasure chatting with you and, and, and going over some old times as well. Thanks, mate. I love what you're doing. Keep it Cheers. up. Cheers, mate.